55-year-old Tom Nevin was shot dead in his pub, Jack White's Inn, near Arklow in the early hours of March 19th last year. He was killed by a single shotgun blast to the side as he counted the takings after the St. Patrick's holiday weekend. His car, which was driven away after the robbery, was found abandoned at Dartmouth Square in Dublin. Today, members of the investigating team took Mr Nevin's widow, Catherine, into custody when she was paying a visit to Dublin. She was arrested in the Ballybock area of the city at lunchtime and driven to the Bridewell Garda station. There she was charged with the murder of her husband and with soliciting others to murder him in 1989 and 1990. A short time later, she was brought before Judge Michael Kennellan in the nearby Dublin District Court. Our story begins with a woman named Catherine Nevin Nee Scully. She was born on the 1st of October 1950. She grew up in the small village of Nerny, County Kildare, with her brother and sister in a small two-bedroom house. Catherine went to school in the Presentation College, County Kildare, an all-girls school run by the nuns. She was described as an excellent student and diligent in her work and gifted with her hands. She invested in a couple of sewing machines when she left school and went around the country giving dressmaking lessons. Catherine then delved into the world of makeup and took a beauty course and gave lectures on makeup and presentation and again she was excellent in her teaching. Her first real job was in the oldest hotel in Dublin called the Castle Hotel. Here she worked as a receptionist. She was described as very efficient by fellow staffers, glamorous and had aspirations to set up her own model agency. She was still only 21 when she would meet a man, Tom Nevin, in 1971. He was 10 years older than her. He was a regular visitor to the hotel and soon romance blossomed. In 1976, they would get married in Rome. Tom was relatively wealthy, a shy, earthy man and was originally from the County Galway village called Tina. He was the eldest of nine children and had a great love of sport, especially hurling. He had an easy-going charm and with Catherine's ambition, they were a heady combination. When he married Catherine, he was managing his uncle's pub in Dolphin's Barn in Dublin. As the years went by, Tom and Catherine went on to acquire and manage many properties around the city of Dublin. Catherine was very much hands-on, decorating the properties and collecting the rents. In March 1986, Tom and Catherine decided to buy Jack White's pub in British Bay, County Galway, and this is where our story is based. They worked hard and were open from 8.30am to late at night. British Bay is a four kilometre stretch of beach on the Irish Sea coast. The beach and associated dunes are very popular with Dubliners and are one of the most frequented beaches by the residents of the capital during the summer. So acquiring Jack White's pub restaurant was a very lucrative move for the Nevins. This is where Catherine would come into her own and where her marriage would go downhill. You see, our Catherine was a bossy lady, a bully and very abusive to both Tom and her staff, which consisted of very young staff. While some would say she was a motherly figure, the general consensus was she was a nightmare to work for. She had no problem belittling Tom in front of the staff and no problem berating her young staff members who would later speak out against her. An example of her pettiness was told by one staff member, where one night after closing, the staff and Tom were sitting around chatting and having a laugh. When Catherine came in to the bar, she didn't like what she saw and confiscated the staff's tip jar, which was so petty and spiteful. Tom was known to the staff as daddy and a gentle giant standing at six foot three. As he was so caring and quiet, the staff loved him. He would go out of his way for any of them. But Catherine ruled the roost with an iron fist. One staff member would report she was so strict and ruthless that it borderlined inhumane. Kathleen, one of the staff, who was a cleaner, was told to come in early, redo rooms she had already cleaned. At one stage, Catherine asked the cleaner to work full time and the cleaner refused. So Catherine rang the social welfare offices and reported that Kathleen refused full-time work and therefore didn't deserve any government help. Like I said, she was pure petty. As early as 1986, Catherine and Tom no longer lived as husband and wife. 
Tom slept in the staff quarters while Catherine slept in the main bedroom and would entertain male friends just a few doors down from Tom's room. So disrespectful, to say the least. Even though Catherine had asked for a divorce several times, Tom didn't want to get a divorce as he had already had an annulment from his first marriage. And because of his family's Catholic background, he didn't want to go down that road again and put his family through another failed marriage. To me, if you can divorce once, then you can again. And it's hard not to think if he had, he'd be still alive today and also not have to go through years of humiliation in front of his staff, friends and patrons. But Catherine wanted to get out of the marriage so badly that between 1989 and 1991, she made no less than 18 requests to have her husband killed. She would benefit greatly from his death. Not only would she be a free agent, she would benefit from getting the pub, which in total would be worth 670,000 Irish pounds. She would also get their two Dublin properties worth 1 million at the time and an insurance policy which would pay out 78,000. Sorry, I don't have an insurance policy montage like our lovely Mike. And lastly, 197,000 Irish pounds in cash. Whoa, feck the insurance policy. Not only was Catherine all I said above, but she was a bit of a goer as we would call her here in Ireland. She had men left, right and centre and no shame in it. As I said, she would have men in her bedroom just down the hallway from where her husband slept. But Catherine didn't just pick any man. She loved men in high profile jobs. And if she was putting in an ad to promote the pub, she didn't want to speak to the staff of the newspaper, but the editor in chief. If someone high profile visited Jack White's, she would fall over herself. She was a bit of a sex kitten and used her sexuality to her advantage. Short skirts, low tops and high heels and men seemed to swoon over her. But to her credit, she knew how to use what she had and men found her very attractive and alluring. She would be impressed by people with social stashes and she would lavish them with charm, free meals and special coffees. We all know what type they were. Splash of whiskey, if you please. On Tuesday the 19th of March 1996, Tom and Catherine were to celebrate what was to be their 10th anniversary of owning Jack White's pub. And of course, it was just after Paddy's weekend, so the pub was extra busy. Tom didn't get the chance to go to the bank, and so on the Tuesday evening, he was downstairs in the kitchen of the pub counting the weekend's takings, and Catherine was asleep upstairs. According to Catherine, she was awoken by someone pressing her face into a pillow. It was a man shouting, fucking jewellery, fucking kill ya. He had a knife in his hand. Catherine was then tied up by her attacker. After a while, she heard two vehicles speeding away. She managed to get to a panic button and the guardy arrived around 4.30 a.m. They found Tom slumped on the kitchen floor in a pool of blood with a gunshot to his chest. Still wearing his glasses and a pen in his hand, he was surely dead. A sum of 13,000 Irish pounds, which would be equivalent to 16,500 euro in today's money, was stolen along with Tom's car, which would later be found in Dublin city abandoned. For all purposes, it looked like a robbery gone wrong, but despite Catherine's story, there was no signs of forced entry and the phone cords had not been pulled out of the walls, but two were off the hook. Catherine's bedroom was in a state of disorder after the raiders fled, but did not appear to have been systematically searched. Jewellery had been scattered around, but none was taken. From the time of the shooting, it would take Catherine a total of two hours before she pressed the alarm button to alert authorities of the break-in. She would greet the guardies scantily clad and tell them she had been tied up with her own black tights and her underwear had been thrust into her mouth as a gag. A Garda fingerprints expert found drawers discarded on the floor, which appeared to have been lifted from the sides and placed on the ground. None of the doors or windows in the pub showed signs of forced entry. She had not gone to her husband's separate bedroom for help once she had freed herself. A witness would recall how on the day of the murder, 
Catherine had told staff they were not welcome to stay there that night in the pub, as they had often done after a night out, especially after bank holiday weekend. While many of the circumstances seemed suspicious, and while Gardaí were confident they had their killer, there was still a lack of firm evidence, no forensics, no eyewitnesses, no admission of guilt. Circumstantial evidence would not be enough to convict her. However, while they built their case, Catherine would play the grieving widow to a tea. All dressed in black, carrying a single red rose and lapping up the sympathy pool from family, friends and people who knew them through their businesses. Catherine even installed a huge headstone at Tom's gravesite and writings of poetry inscribed showing her love for Tom and she even took out an advertisement in a local newspaper that spoke of her devotion to Tom. Please get me a bucket. It was all very dramatic and over the top. It would take until April 1997 before Catherine would be arrested, just after she sold the pub for half a million pounds. When she was later charged with murder and solicitation to murder, she was well on her way to becoming one of the most talked about and easily recognised people in the country. Later, Tom's family would apply to the courts to have all assets frozen until the outcome of the trial, including the money from the sale of the pub. In 2000, the first trial collapsed when it became known the jury could be overheard in the deliberation room. The second trial was delayed when Catherine was admitted to hospital and it resumed a few days later. Catherine pleaded not guilty and as the prosecution had only circumstantial evidence, they relied heavily on three particular witnesses. Catherine had approached three men between 1989 and 1991 and these were the witnesses. The first man was William McLean, a self-confessed smuggler from County Monaghan. He was one of the first barmen to work in Jack White's pub when the Nevins took it over. He was also the first known extramarital lover of Catherine's and he said he was paid only in kindness. Years later he would get a phone call from Catherine stating she was in hospital after having a heart attack but in fact it was cosmetic surgery. She told McLean that there was £20,000 in it for him and that they'd even get back together if he would kill Tom. The answer was no. The second man was John Jones, a former member of the political party Sinn Féin, who ran an advice clinic at the back of his shop in Dublin. She had offered to host meetings in the pub to get in good favour with the IRA. She called to his shop one day and said to him straight out, I want the IRA to kill Tom. Jones thought she was joking and told her, no way. A few weeks later, she would call again with a plan, but Jones would refuse once more. She even turned up at his business premises bruised and bandaged, claiming Tom had beaten her up. In fact, she had just got cosmetic surgery again. It seems our Catherine was fond of the old surgery back in the day. Eventually, she got the message and stopped asking. The third of these witnesses was Jerry Heaps, a former provo, which would be to you and me the provisional Irish Republican Army, and he worked for John Jones in his shop. It was Jones who had originally introduced Jerry to Catherine. She approached him at least 10 times, asking him for a way to kill Tom. Then she suggested to him that he could be killed on one of his weekly visits to the flats he owned. It would be an opportune moment as he would have the pub takings with him. He said every time he knocked her back, she would come up with another idea. One of these involved ambushing him after having a meal out with Catherine. He told her he couldn't do that because the bulk of the shot would pass through him and hit her. Catherine supplied to this, but it would look great if Tom was to die in my arms. Jerry said no once again. Catherine also would have an affair with guard inspector Tom Kennedy, an affair he would deny in court. This affair began in 1991. Several staff members would say in court that Kennedy was a frequent visitor to the pub and one staff member said she had seen him and Catherine in bed together on several occasions. Kennedy would say that Tom was his friend and he was the only reason he went to the pub. But Tom would say different to one of his staff the morning after a retirement party that was held at the pub for Kennedy. 
where Katrin would gift him paid flights to New York to visit his children. A very generous gift on Katrin's part. Tom would say to the staff member, this will all end in tears. And Tom would also say, how would you like if you saw Tom Kennedy in your wife's bedroom? Kennedy would go on to say to Gardy that Katrin was the type of woman who would give you a pain in the head when she started getting on about things. He said he was aware of the rumours of him and Katrin having an affair, but that he was over 60 and that sex would not be a concern of his. Weird. Next we have Judge Donica Obukula, who was introduced to Katrin by Tom Kennedy. It was said he too had an affair with her and again like Kennedy, he denied this. It was also said that he had his own key to the pub and he'd let himself in and out at all hours of the night. It was said that Tom was very upset by this affair, according to staff members, and he would fight with Catherine a lot over it. Catherine would also go on to deny these affairs in court. On the day before Tom's murder, Monday the 18th of March, there was a steady trade in the bar and lounge. The only unusual thing that happened that day was a visit by a strange man wearing a long overcoat and carrying a bag. This man then went to make a phone call and one of the staff said he was muttering into the phone. He spoke to Tom and presumed Tom knew him by the way they spoke to each other. This man was not seen leaving the pub that day and it is a possibility that he didn't leave, but hid in the pub and later in fact it was he who shot Tom. Also after Tom died and Catherine was under investigation for his murder, there was no objection to oppose her taking on the license of the public house exclusively. The judge Donica Obukula would be the one to grant her the license in his private chambers. Another theory was that Catherine herself was the one who pulled the trigger as she was the only one in the pub that night. Tom didn't appear to act defensively immediately prior to him being shot. He still had his glasses on his nose and his pen was in his hand when Gardie found him. He would not have been unduly surprised by her arrival in the kitchen. While there was no evidence of firearm residue found on her clothing, they only tested the clothes she was wearing on that night. But she could have changed her clothes before she tied herself up. After all, she had two hours before she got help. She also admitted to washing her hands before their arrival. In another scenario, Catherine would have had to be assisted by an accomplice who tied her hands and took the money, the gun and the car to Dublin. The other theory is that Catherine helped one or more people to carry out the killing. The trial of the callous black widow, as she was dubbed, gripped the nation from start to finish and quickly saw her become one of the most high profile killers the country had ever seen. She assassinated Tom's character by saying he was abusive, a drunk and a member of the IRA. Despite the continually glamorous appearance of the impeccably groomed Catherine, little could hide her tight mouth or stubborn chin, along with the seemingly determination to appear matronly rather than sexy. Her appearance was in itself part of the incredible tissues of lies that she had built up to protect herself. The media reported on Catherine's appearance, from her clothes, her hair and makeup, and even down to her nail polish. In court, it became such a problem that Judge Carl put a ban on the press reporting on her appearance. After a gripping 42 day trial, the jury of six men and six women deliberated for a record five days before she was found guilty in April 2000 for paying a hitman to murder her husband and for soliciting three men to do the same. She received life in prison. Judge Carl, in her statement to Catherine on sentencing, was you had your husband assassinated and you tried to assassinate his character as well. I hope his family would take solace from this verdict and sentencing. Three years later, Catherine was back in court trying to get her case overturned. The Court of Criminal Appeal said, however, that it was satisfied there was nothing in the new material that could come to light that could have assisted in Catherine's defence and so it was dismissed. In 2010, she had another miscarriage of justice appeal dismissed. In 2014, she was denied in her bid to appeal her murder conviction to the Supreme Court. Tom had not made a will and Catherine and himself never had any children, so she was to inherit everything. Tom's mother had effectively frozen Tom's estate, including the proceeds from the sale of the pub. 
The application of probate by Catherine was still pending on the results of the trial and when she was found guilty, she lost any claim to the estate. Tom's mother had also initiated legal proceedings to try and have her disinherited. She died a year before Catherine had been convicted of her son's murder and her case was taken over by her son Patrick and daughter Margaret. They believed they should be allowed to rely on her conviction as part of their legal action and the Supreme Court agreed. So basically Catherine got absolutely nothing when she was found guilty. In September 2016, Catherine was admitted to hospital and was later diagnosed with a terminal brain tumour. She was there for three days and was given RTR, which is a reviewable temporary release so she could receive treatment. On November 7, 2016, she was taken to an acute post-care unit while undergoing medical treatment. She stayed there until August 2017, when she again received RTR for pre-release and re-socialisation. She was provided with support accommodation and stayed there until she was re-hospitalised on the 6th of November 2017. In December 2017, she was moved to a hospice care facility, where she remained until her death in February 2018. She was 67. Catherine protested her innocence until her end. Catherine insisted that just because she was convicted of murder by a jury, this was not conclusive proof of her guilt. She also never revealed who had helped her kill Tom. <laughs>